Welcome everyone. I'm Vincent J. Russo, and I'll be your presenter today on establishing tax basics of special needs trusts for the American College of Financial Services. I'm very excited to be with you today. We're going to cover the tax basics, but it's going to be a very robust program. Uh, so we're going to move uh, fairly quickly, but I think it'll be all really good information for all of you. Um, and um, I'll do my best to leave uh, some time at the end for some questions. A little uh, about myself. Um, I'm the managing shareholder of the Russo Law Group. Uh, we are a Long Island-based elder law special needs and estate planning law firm uh, with five offices on Long Island and New York City. Uh, and my focus has been uh, my entire career on helping people in the planning arena, in particular people with disabilities, special needs, uh, and the elderly. But let's get started. So today, what I'll be covering first will be the overall tax treatment of trusts, in particular, focusing in on third party and first party special needs trusts. We'll get into drafting considerations, which have tax implications. We'll discuss the tax consequences to the trust, the grantor, and the beneficiary. We'll discuss qualified disability trusts, and we'll touch on retirement trusts. Quite frankly, any one of these topics uh, could be a full hour presentation. Uh, but today we're gonna do the tax basics. So first let's start with tax treatment of third party and first party special needs trusts. Now, before we get into the discussion, uh, I just wanna to refer to the Internal Revenue Code. Uh, for those who are not familiar with the code, uh, the code is broken up into sections. So if you have to look at um, what the um, Internal Revenue Code provides, today, we're gonna to be spending time on the income taxation of trust. And so you need to know that the discussion will be covering code sections 671 to 678. When we talk about gift taxation, we're in the 2500 series of the code, 2501 to 2505. And when we talk about estate taxes, we're in the 2000 series of the code, starting at 2001. So just, a, a, just an overview of where to find the information in the Internal Revenue Code. Now, we're gonna start with a general rule. And like any general rule, there are lots of exceptions. So the general rule is that if we have a trust and income is generated, that income of the trust will be subject to tax, income tax. And the question will be, who will report that taxable income? So the general rule is that the income must be reported on the trust income tax return. That is form 1041, but we have exceptions. So one exception is that all the income may be reported on the grantor's personal income tax return. The grantor is the person who established the trust. We'll often refer to that type of trust as a grantor trust for tax purposes. The trust has $10,000 of income and it's a grantor trust. Then all the income will be reported by the grantor, not on the trust income tax return for tax purposes. The second exception is all or part of the income may be reported on the beneficiary's personal income tax return. Here, it's a open door. It depends on how the trust is drafted. And we're gonna get into that today uh, so that the beneficiary may be reporting all or part of the trust income, even though it's not a grantor trust. And we'll refer to that as a non-grantor trust situation. And then the third would be all or part of the income may be reported on the trust income tax return. Here, it would also be referred to as a non-grantor trust. 
So with these exceptions uh, to the general rule that all the trust income gets reported by the trust, one exception, if it's a grantor trust, all the income gets reported by the grantor. And if it's a non-grantor trust, then some or all the income may be reported by the beneficiary or some or all of it may be reported by the trust. The other piece I wanna give you up front, very important uh, in our consideration of trust taxation are the 2021 federal tax brackets. And you'll see here that for personal income taxation, there are seven brackets running from 10% to 37%. And you'll see that you don't hit the 37% tax bracket until you have $523,601 or more of taxable income. Now let's go, if you're married, that number goes up. Let's go to the far right column and let's look at taxation of trust. There were only four brackets instead of seven. And you'll see that the brackets um, kick in very quickly. So at 24% tax rate, it's someone who has, uh, the trust has taxable income that will be taxed to the trust of $2,651 up to $9,550 versus roughly 86,000 or more um, if I was a single individual reporting that income. And then look at the bottom right corner. We're in the 37% tax bracket. If the trust has to report the income and pay the tax, once that trust has taxable income of $13,051, we're in the 37% tax bracket. For a single person, you wouldn't hit that number until you were at over 523,000 or married over 628,000. So what this means is that we, when we're uh, planning uh, for the tax consequences of a trust, we want to minimize the trust as a general rule reporting income because we're going to find that that income is going to be taxed at a much higher rate than if it was pushed back to the grantor, the person who established it, or pushed out to a beneficiary who would fall in the single or married uh, tax brackets on the screen. Now let's get into the world of special needs trusts. And today there's going to be two trusts that we're going to be focusing in on, a third party special needs trust and a first party special needs trust. The third party special needs trust is a trust set up by an individual for the benefit of another individual, not for their own benefit. And it's being funded with the assets of the individual setting up the trust. A good example of that would be a parent setting up a trust for the benefit of their child who is disabled. We refer to that trust where the provisions of the trust would supplement the needs uh, of the child with special needs or is disabled. And that would be referred to as a third party special needs trust or a third party supplemental needs trust. And <clears throat> that's to be differentiated from a, a first party trust, which would be a trust set up by an individual with their own assets for their own benefit, all right? Uh, and that we're gonna get to later on. So I wanna start with third party special needs trust. This is the more common of the two trusts. Um, there are parents who are so concerned about the well being of a child with special needs, minor or adult, and they wanna provide uh, for that child, maximize their quality of life while also maximizing government benefits. And that can be done. And so today, our angle would be focusing in on the taxation of such a trust. Now, there are two types of third-party special needs trust, one that's set up during lifetime by the individual, and the other would be what would be referred to as a testamentary trust, 
which would be the special needs trust would be established under a will or under an existing trust when the grantor passes away. And the tax treatment will vary uh, when we're talking about a lifetime third party special needs trust versus a testamentary third party special needs trust. So let's start with lifetime special needs trusts. First, when the trust is funded, we have to address uh, whether there's a gift tax involved. So the three tax areas we're gonna keep talking about are gift taxation, income taxation, and estate taxation. So for purposes of the funding of a third party special needs trust during the grantor's lifetime, is that a completed gift or an incomplete gift for gift tax purposes? You need to refer to Internal Revenue Code 2503 and beyond um, for the provisions uh, under federal law. The general rule is, is that when you make a transfer to a trust and you give up dominion and control over that asset, then it is a completed gift subject to the gift tax rules. And if you maintain control over that trust in certain ways, then it will be, in, it will be treated as an incomplete gift. Now, when we set up a third party special needs trust during lifetime, it can be irrevocable or it could be revocable. If it's revocable, it's an incomplete gift on funding. If it's irrevocable, then it will depend on the provisions in the trust. They're called taints or strings. And so uh, is, are there provisions in the trust where the grantor has retained control in a way that the IRS says um, you've made a completed gift? or an incompleted gift. So if I have an irrevocable trust, for example, and retain a limited power of appointment, which allows me to control who the beneficiaries are of the assets in the trust, then that would be treated, then that trust would be treated as, an in, as a trust that was funded with an incomplete gift. So we can have revocable trusts, third-party special needs, understanding it's, in, it's funded as an incomplete gift, or we could do estate tax planning and get assets out of the estate of the grantor for estate tax purposes by making it an irrevocable trust and then making sure we haven't tainted it in a way that would pull it back to the grantor and make it an incomplete gift. Uh, one last thought comment on this is that the, back in 2012, the IRS's uh, chief counsel had a memorandum questioning whether a limited power of attorney, a, appointment would make it an incompleted gift, um, but we've seen no action taken by the, um, the Internal Revenue Service in that regard. So at the moment, my sense is that you're, you can be comfortable that a limited power of appointment would make it an incompleted gift. Let's move on to income taxation of a third party special needs trust. During lifetime, the trust can be set up as a grantor trust, which would push all the income back to the person who set it up, the parent in my example, uh, or a non-grantor trust. Now for tax purposes, when you're one accountant speaking to another, for example, they may refer to a non-grantor trust as a complex trust. That's the terminology that is often used. If it was a trust set up under a will or an existing trust, and so upon the demise of the grantor, uh, that trust is uh, established and funded, then that's always a non-grantor trust. Remembering grantor trust pushes it, all the income back to the grantor, non-grantor opens the door, that the trust may have to pay the tax on, on the income or the beneficiary or in some uh, pro rata way. And I'll explain how that works. So drafting considerations become really important because depending on the provisions in the trust, 
uh, it will steer us in one direction or another. We can draft it in a way that a trust is a grantor trust. We can draft it as a non-grantor trust. All right, now, as I mentioned up front, when we're in the income tax world, we're in code section 671 to 678. And these are called taints. This is where certain provisions can be um, placed into our third party special needs trust, or I'll call it a SNP. And those provisions will then trigger the trust to be treated as a grantor trust, an exception to the general rule that the trust report the income and pay the tax and push all the income back up to the grantor. And often that is the, that is the preference because the grantor is an individual and the tax rates are more favorable than the trust tax rates. So what are the taints that we see in these types of trusts? Um, it might be a reversionary interest in the trust under code section 673. Uh, basically a reversionary interest is where the trust uh, corpus, the assets of the, of the trust or trust principles, sometimes that's the terminology, um, will revert back to the person who established the trust. It may revert back to their estate, for example. The next one is gonna fall under code section 675. This is a very common provision that the grantor retains the right to exchange property of equivalent value in a non-fiduciary capacity. Basically what that means is the provision says that the grantor can exchange in his asset that's in her name and place it into the trust and take assets out of the trust of equivalent value. And it doesn't mean you have to exercise that power, just having that right taints it and makes it a grantor trust. And then third, using trust income to pay premiums of insurance on, li on the life of the grantor or the grantor's spouse. That also will taint it and make it a grantor trust on the code section 677. We move on to power to revoke, code section 676. That's going to taint it and make it a grantor trust. All right, now I got a little note here, getting ahead of myself, that you never want to have a first party special needs trust be a revocable trust because then that's going to adversely impact government benefits and eligibility for those benefits. So when the beneficiary is accessing or seeking uh, to qualify, uh, we, we've got to make sure in a first party trust, it's always irrevocable. Another section, which is important for you to be aware of is code section 677. Income payable by the grantor or non-adverse party trustee to the grantor will make it a, a grantor trust. So if the grantor retained the right to receive the income, but that wouldn't be typical in a third party SNIT because you're putting those assets in there for the benefit of your child, your loved one with special needs. Now, when you trigger that provision, we have to understand who a non-adverse party is. And that's a, um, it's someone who is not adverse. An adverse party is any person who has a substantial beneficial interest in the trust, which would be adversely affected. So if the person would be a beneficiary of that trust, for example, and their trustee, then they would be treated as a adverse party. Um, but if they had no interest in the trust, then they would be non-adverse. Now I'm gonna make it a little more complicated and I apologize. <clears throat> but when you taint the trust and make it a grantor trust, uh, there are different rules for making it a grantor trust for over the income and a grantor trust over the principal, the assets themselves. Now this can be really important when dealing with appreciated assets in the trust. So for example, if a residence was placed in a trust and later that residence was sold, 
we really would like to have that trust structured as a grantor trust. So the beneficiary, the grantor can report that sale on their personal return, and then they have a capital gain. Um, now that capital gain can be offset or eliminated by qualifying under Internal Revenue Code 121 for an exemption on the sale of the primary residence. That exemption is 250,000 for an individual, 500,000 for a married couple. You have to own and, and occupy um, the uh, property two out of the last five years. So that may be a provision that's really important for us to have, but we have to make sure that it's been tainted in a way that would make it a grantor trust over the corpus, the assets, the principal, so we can qualify. All right, so we're gonna talk about how do we do that. Uh, this will ensure that individual capital gains tax rates apply when trust assets are sold. So the trust capital gain tax rates kick in more quickly, just like regular income does, uh, versus the individual reporting capital gains. So how do we get control in, uh, over the corpus, the principal? So we have to have a particular power, and there are two powers that work really well. So, if the, if the, so in order for the grantor to have a power that gives grantor trust status, with respect to principal, one, the power to substitute assets of equivalent value. That will make it a grantor trust over the assets. Or the power to add charitable beneficiaries on the code section 674. So if we taint it, 675, power to substitute assets, or 674, add beneficiaries, uh, that will do it. Now, if you wanna create a state tax inclusion, so you have a parent with a non-estate uh, taxable estate, uh, you would want to get a step up in basis. And so you'd want the assets in that trust not only to be funded as an incompleted gift, have the grantor report the income as a grantor trust, but also have it included for estate tax purposes. So a testamentary power of appointment to change beneficiaries is a nice power on the code section 2036A2, which will call, cause the state tax inclusion. So when you're dealing with the special needs attorneys uh, and elder law attorneys, they're, they're familiar generally with all of these taints and how to draft these documents. Um, and so that's something that uh, they can work with the financial advisor and the accountant uh, to ensure that everybody's on the same page. Now, let's talk about the income tax consequences when we are talking about whether the trust has to report it, the beneficiary, or in some fashion between the two. Uh, and we've touched on how we make it um, a grantor trust to push it all back to the grantor. So I just wanna give you the big picture here talk about advantages of one trust versus the other. So let's talk about the advantages of a grantor trust. The advantage here would be that the income tax consequences stay with the grantor. So when we consider the maximum tax bracket of the grantor, single person reaching 37% at 523,000 plus, while the trust reaches that bracket at 13,000 plus, it's clear that pushing that income back to the grantor is the preference. Now, the other advantage is it's a simpler tax filing. Uh, so what I mean by that is when you have a grantor trust as a third party special needs trust, you can provide for the tax ID number to be the social security number of the grantor. So if all the assets are under that grantor social security number, then there's uh, no need to file a trust tax return for the third party SNP. In the alternative, if, if you get a separate tax ID number for the third party SNP, then that 
return becomes what I'll call an informational return. Basically, the trust will never pay any tax on that return. It's a grantor trust. You note that on the 1041 uh, by checking a box on the first page. And then you would be attaching, in effect, a report of what the income and, and expenses are of that trust. And that report would pass on, be passed on to the grantor who then would report it on their personal income tax return. Um, and so simpler tax filing. It's, it's easy for the grantor to understand. Uh, it's also easy for the ben easier for the beneficiary to understand. So explaining that to the uh, client's important because the last thing we want to do is make life so complicated for the parents who have so much to think about and do when taking care of a child with special needs that if we make it overly complicated, um, perhaps then they never move forward and implement the planning that they need to implement. So tax advantages, um, minimizing income taxation, simpler tax filing, easier to explain to the client. Now let's compare that to the advantages of a non-grantor trust. So in a non-grantor trust, either the trust is gonna report the income or the beneficiaries or some combination of the two. The income doesn't get pushed back up to the grantor. So the grantor does not need funds to pay tax on phantom income. Now, what I mean by that is when the grantor has um, a, a, established a third party SNIT as a grantor trust, and let's say there was $30,000 of taxable income. They're reporting that income on their personal income tax return. Um, and that's not income they're actually receiving because that income staying in the trust for the benefit of the child with special needs. Now you can get more sophisticated in draft to allow for that trust to pay the tax on the income uh, portion uh, reflecting that $30,000 of income, whatever that tax would be, that you can put a provision in the trust to allow the trustee to pay that share of the tax. Uh, another advantage is spreading out the income tax consequences. So what I mean by that is you could have the trust uh, report the income going up the bracket up to roughly 13,000, and then you can have the excess income out to the beneficiary and they're running up a bracket so you can, you can look at the bracket rates and you could play the brackets. It's not a big savings here. Uh, clearly pushing it to the beneficiary or up to the grantor creates a big spread and a significant benefit, but not so much when you're playing it between the trust and the beneficiary. Now, the beneficiary receives the income, pays the income tax in the beneficiary's tax bracket. So an example would be here, and I'm simplifying things for you today. Uh, let's say that trust, third-party SNIT, non-grantor trust, has uh, $20,000 of income, and the trustee spends $20,000 for the benefit of that beneficiary. So they pay for uh, a vacation. They pay for uh, medical care not covered by Medicaid or some other government benefit. They pay for housing, uh, enhancing the quality of life of that beneficiary. So we have $20,000 of taxable income. We spent $20,000 for the benefit of the beneficiary. When that return gets filed, uh, $20,000 now is reportable by the beneficiary, and they have to pay the tax. Now, of course, the trust can pay the tax for the beneficiary. Uh, and, and so here the benefit would be we're pushing it to the beneficiaries in a lower tax bracket than the trust, but they also may be in a lower tax bracket than the parent, because we could have pushed it up to the parent. Let's say that parent has $300,000 of, of taxable income, where the beneficiary has zero taxable income, but for the trust amount. So there could be an advantage there. And then in a little bit, we're going to touch on what are called qualified disability trusts, and you get a little benefit there through a higher exemption amount which will reduce the tax. 
the disadvantage of a, of a non-grantor trust that if you're not careful, you can have higher overall taxes. Let's say that a trust had $50,000 uh, and it's a non-grantor third-party SNP and it's not a grantor trust. So the trust now in general rule is gonna pay it unless it spent the money for the benefit of the beneficiary. Let's say in a given year that $50,000 we only spend $5,000 on the beneficiary. Now $45,000 is gonna be uh, taxable at the trust rates. And we ended up with a higher overall rate because we didn't push it down to the beneficiary. We didn't push it back up to the grantor. So we have to be careful about that. It's always good as a tip that uh, the team get together at the end of every year to analyze what kind of trust income is there? How much was spent on be, on the for the benefit of the of the child with special needs, uh, so that there is some room to work things out to minimize taxes. And then clearly, when you're in a non-grantor trust and you have to explain how these trust rules way, work, it's more complicated. There's that extra step where I recommend the additional planning at the end of the year or at the very beginning of the following year. And the trustee needs to really pay attention to calendar year end distributions. Now, why it's really important uh, for the trustee to pay attention is we have another rule that you should be aware of. And it's called the 65 day rule. And the 65 day rule comes into play for a non grantor trust. And basically, it allows the trustee during the first 65 days of the following calendar year, the following taxable year, to make a decision to spend money for the benefit of the beneficiary and elect to have it reported as if it had been paid out in the prior calendar year. So let's say in my example, of the $50,000 and we only spend 5,000. Uh, and if the beneficiary had legitimate needs during that 65 days, we could spend money in that 65 day period. Let's say we spent $20,000 and then we can treat it as if it was spent in the prior year. So now this 50,000 and, and we spend 20 more plus the five, then 25,000 gets pushed to the beneficiary to report as taxable income, and only 25 gets reported by the trust instead of 45. So there's a benefit there. Uh, that rule's in place because it's hard for trustees to know how much taxable income they, do they have until you get past the end of the year. Now, how that calculation is made is is uh, called distributable net income. And it's a fairly complex rule. I've made it very simple for you. If the funds that are generated in the trust is income, that it will be subject to tax. If the trustee uses it for the benefit of the beneficiary, we're likely not putting it in the beneficiary's name, I hope, because we don't want to adversely affect eligibility for SSI, supplemental security income, or Medicaid, so it's always going to be for the benefit of, then a calculation is made uh, to determine what's distributable net income. And distributable net income is the amount that will be picked up by the beneficiary to be reported on their, uh, the beneficiary's personal income tax return. All right. And as I said, you can kind of fix the DNI by the 65 day rule by making additional distributions and then electing on the return, you got to check a box and elect to have that, those funds treated um, as distributed uh, in the prior tax year. Now, the trap may be that the beneficiary now has to report the income, but I don't see that really as uh, in most cases as a problem because actually we're happy that they're gonna report it uh, because they're gonna be in a lower tax bracket than the trust. So now we're gonna move into the world of estate taxation of third-party special needs trusts. And here, 
Um, it's going to be a drafting issue um, and, and a, really a planning issue. Does the grantor want to transfer assets to a third party SNIT and have it excluded from their estate or included? They're doing estate tax planning they want to exclude. If they want to make sure they get a step up in basis under the current rules, we don't know what's going to happen with the, uh, the, the Biden administration and the legislature this coming year or two, whether those rules change. But if we want it included, then we have to have strings in that trust that will push it back into the estate of the grantor reported as part of their estate with a step up in basis. So a typical string might be uh, code section 2036, maintaining control or beneficial enjoyment. I uh, hear a uh, limited power of appointment would do that, just like I mentioned in the grantor income tax rules. Um, and or, or a reversionary interest. If you want to exclude, then you really need to make sure there's no control or beneficial enjoyment uh, in that trust. So here again, um, really important to understand what's the big picture. Let's make sure we're, we're planning in the big picture. We want to make sure this trust always qualifies that beneficiary in a way for, for government benefits. We don't want to have provisions that would disrupt that or adversely impact their eligibility. Uh, we want to fund it in a way uh, that between funding, the gift rules, and the estate tax rules, do we want to fund it as an incomplete gift, have it included in the estate, get a step up in basis uh, for the, uh, those assets, or do we want to have it as a completed gift excluded from the estate? And it all has to do with the provisions in the trust and, and the rules are not the same. You've got gift tax rules, income tax rules and estate tax rules. And even though some of them are the same, some of them may not be. So, yet, so you really have to be careful in how it's all framed. Now I wanna move to a, a, a specific type of trust under the tax laws called a qualified disability trust. This is a third party special needs trust, non-grantor trust. So it's gonna to have to be irrevocable uh, and we, it cannot be tainted to make it a um, non, uh, to make it a grantor trust. Now the advantage, and then I'll talk about how to qualify. The advantage is that you, instead of getting a $100 exemption in 2021, uh, when the trust reports the income, the exemption will be $4,300. So this will allow the first $4,300 to be tax-free in every third-party SNID set up as a qualified disability trust. Now, there are five prongs to qualifying as a qualified disability trust. One is it has to be irrevocable. Two, all the beneficiaries must be disabled. Um, and so there's a, a disability uh, requirement. Three, the uh, trust cannot be a grantor trust. Four, the trust must be established for the benefit of a disabled individual 65 years of age or younger. So as long as that beneficiary is under 65 when the trust is established, um, it can qualify. And when that person reaches 65 or older, it does not disqualify. It. And then lastly, um, if the uh, corpus of the trust on the demise of the beneficiary passes to someone else, then, um, then who's not disabled, that is okay. Okay, there's no, uh, it can still qualify. There's no requirement uh, for any sort of payback to the government, for example, or to be paid to the estate of the disabled uh, beneficiary. Now we get a, a little more complicated on one other aspect of these trusts, and that's the kitty tax um, uh, provisions. So I'm going to really thumb it down for you because uh, I want to make sure I cover everything. Uh, but the kitty tax basically applies where the uh, the IRS was concerned that if, if you had a trust set up by a parent and you push the income down to the child, 
uh, that we were playing the tax brackets. And so the kitty tax would push the, that income back up to the parent and the parent would have to pay the tax. So there's a general rule, a child under 19 uh, would be a, a minor uh, and, and that, that individual child would fall under the uh, kitty tax rules. So when we get to the uh, trust rules, where a trust uh, third party SNID pushes income to a beneficiary and that beneficiary uh, falls under the kitty tax rules. And there are exceptions for later ages, um, um, don't have time to get into it all right now. But if we push that income down to the beneficiary and the beneficiary falls under the kitty tax rules, it would push it back up to the parents' tax rates on that income. Now, just to give you a little update here, that in December of 2017, under the Tax Cuts and Job Act, there was a change in the kitty tax rules that said it wouldn't be pushed up at the parents' rates, it would be pushed um, uh, at the push to the trust tax rates. So that was a really uh, bad provision. And thankfully the SECURE Act repealed uh, the uh, TCJA and restored the pre-2018 rules, rules for tax, a, tax, a, taxing unearned income of a taxpayer under age 19. And, and so we're back to the parents' rates. But the good news is that income that's pushed down to a beneficiary of a third party SNIT that is also treated as a qualified disability trust, that income is not subject to the kitty tax at all, those rules. So there's a big exception and another benefit beyond the exemption amount would be avoiding the kitty tax rules with a qualified disability trust. Let's move on to testamentary third party SNITs. Going to keep this really simple. If you have a, a, a SNIT established under a will or trust, it's automatically a non grantor trust, and the rules we talked about would apply. It is not subject to the gift tax laws when funded, um, and it would be included in the estate of the deceased individual who uh, had the will or trust that was establishing the third party uh, SNIT. Let's move on to first party special needs trust. <clears throat> and here I want to um, just upfront quickly explain this is a trust established by uh, an individual who is disabled, parent, grandparent, court, uh, or legal guardian uh, with the assets of the person who is disabled under age 65. And the, the benefit of a first party special needs trust is those assets will not be treated as available for purposes of qualifying uh, for Medicaid or SSI, supplemental security income. Uh, and so there's no adverse impact on those government benefit programs. Uh, the one condition though is, is what then that when that beneficiary passes away, there is a payback to, uh, to the government for any Medicaid paid during the lifetime of that individual. So we're gonna let you stay on government benefits or we're gonna let you use the assets. And if there are no assets at the end, there's no payback. Uh, but if you don't use the assets all up and when you pass away, um, we'll, we'll wanna get our share back. And if there's any monies remaining after the payback, then it can go on to the estate or to other beneficiaries. So, Making this simple, and this is maybe the best one slide uh, that you can print out uh, and just uh, use it as a cheat sheet, that when you have a first party special needs trust, it's an incomplete gift for gift tax purposes. Yes, you can throw uh, provisions in there to taint it, uh, but the overall understanding among uh, myself and, our, and my colleagues is that um, there's sufficient dominion and control arguments that can be made. And we've seen no uh, first party SNID being subject to a gift tax um, um, under the law. And the first party SNID's been in place since uh, 1993. For income tax purposes, here again, it's a grant, it's going to be a grantor trust. Um, I've given you the code sections. 
It's, in my opinion, always going to be a grant to a trust. Um, there is some, some minority of colleagues that believe maybe you can taint the trust in a way that makes it outside of the grant to a trust rules. Uh, but I believe it's a grant to a trust uh, and the grantor is the beneficiary. Really important to understand that even though a parent may say have set up the trust, the IRS has a revenue ruling from many, many years ago that says because the trust is being funded with the assets of the beneficiary for the beneficiary's use, they're treated as the grantor. And it's code section 673, 677A1, 677A3. These are all taints that you could put in. And for estate tax purposes, it will be included in the estate of the beneficiary, who's also for tax purposes gonna be treated as the grantor. All right, I'm gonna give you a couple minutes on retirement trust. Uh, this could be a 60 minute to three hour presentation. Um, and uh, I just wanna just touch on this because we said it, we're setting up these third party SNITs and if it's funded later on the demise of the grantor with their qualified retirement assets, um, IRA, 401k, under the SECURE Act, as everyone's aware, uh, the uh, account must be distributed. Uh, this is an inherited trust uh, situation, must be distributed uh, within a 10-year period. Uh, so if I have an inherited IRA, uh, we've got a 10-year rule. And the exceptions are now for, an, what, for individuals who are called an eligible designated beneficiary. Uh, and they are a surviving spouse, a beneficiary who, are, who is disabled, chronically ill, someone who's no more than 10 years younger than the original account owner, and minors only during the period the beneficiary is a minor. So understanding this, uh, we get outside of the 10-year rule and we can set up a third-party SNIT in a way to make it what's called an accumulation trust that will allow us to pay it over the lifetime of that beneficiary instead of ten, or within the 10-year period. Now, someone who is disabled is they're basically going to follow the Social Security disability criteria for determining disability. Uh, someone who is chronically ill uh, has to be unable to do two of five activities of daily living of the six listed in the code or have a disability similar to that or may have a cognitive impairment such that they need substantial supervision for their health and safety. So once we have a third-party SNIT, we're going to fund it with qualified uh, uh, retirement funds. We want to also then qualify it as an accumulation trust. So an accumulation trust is basically a discretionary trust. In our case, it would be supplemental needs for the benefit of a disabled or chronically ill individual. And if you qualify it under the SECURE Act, uh, then the measuring light for determining required minimum distributions uh, would be the person who is uh, an eligible, a designated eligible beneficiary, disabled or chronically ill individual. And that would allow for the payout. So now uh, us, uh, who are the attorneys drafting special needs trusts, third party, we now are drafting what's called a secure special needs trust. It's a special needs trust that allows us to maximize the government benefits, allows us to, um, to uh, qualify for government benefits such as Medicaid or SSI, enhance the quality of life for the beneficiary um, while uh, passing those on in a way, uh, depending on that individual situation, the person setting it up to minimize income taxes and estate taxes. We layer in now provisions uh, which allow us to have it qualify as an accumulation trust, still maximizing the government benefits for the beneficiary. And now we don't have to pay that out over a 10 year period, but over the lifetime. So when we get into a situation where we have a parent with uh, parents with 
three children, uh, John, Mary, Jane, and John is special needs, uh, and they have a number of different assets. And we now have to think about, well, which assets do we want to fund the third party SNP with? And it may be that there's a preference to fund that trust with the retirement account monies, because now it can be spread out over the lifetime of that beneficiary. Uh, and then when it gets pushed out um, in, under the DNI rule, uh, we're in a lower tax bracket than the trust tax brackets. So um, food for thought. So what we've covered today, uh, and I know, and I apologize that we covered this very quickly. Um, my goal was to give you the basics of what you need to know and also identify the issues. Um, and, and then you can take it from there. So we talked about income taxation, gift taxation, estate taxation, and the treatment of those three different taxes when a third party special needs trust is set up or a first party special needs trust is set up. Just so we throw it out there, I have to do this. You would never wanna combine those two trusts into one trust because with the third party special needs trust, there is no payback requirement to the government um, with regard to this, the benefits given or provided to the beneficiary while in a first party special needs trust, there is a payback requirement for Medicaid. So then we, we understanding these rules and the tax brackets, we've talked about the drafting considerations. Um, we've covered the different ways uh, we can draft to taint the trust or uh, to make it an incomplete gift or to make it includable in the estate or to change or channel how trust income will be taxed either to the trust, the grantor, the beneficiary. And then we just spent a couple minutes on qualified disability trusts. Um, there's a benefit there, a little bit about the kitty tax rules and a real, like a one, two minutes on retirement trusts. Um, so hopefully this has been helpful to you um, and given you a good overview. Uh, I see there are lots of questions in the chat uh, in the Q&A uh, box here. I'll try to take a quick look at them and see um, um, if I can address some of these quickly. And um, so we have a few more minutes. Let's, let's see how this goes. Uh, first question from Tim, does the, does the trust taxation matter if it's revocable or irrevocable? Yes, um, if it's revocable, it's always a grant toward trust uh, for tax purposes. And if it's irrevocable, it may or may not be a grantor trust, depending on the provisions. All right, Mark asks, when the grantor of the third party trust dies, how should the taxation of the trust be handled moving forward? And so it's, if you have a grantor situation, it, it is converted to a non-grantor trust. And in the year that the grantor dies, part of the year will be grantor trust and taxed and part of the year will be treated and taxed as a non-grantor trust. Next question uh, from Ed. The grantor trust status and pushing the income tax back up to the grantor is only available during the lifetime of the grantor. After the grantor's debt, can the income be pushed out to the beneficiary or will it by default be subject to tr the trust reporting it at a higher rate? So hopefully I've explained uh, that no, we draft, so we allow to push that income onto the beneficiary's income tax return. Okay, um, can an annuity be used as an investment in the trust to defer the generation of trust income? Yes, we didn't touch on the fact that the trust assets uh, that the trustee has control over can be structured in a way so that there's never any income tax, you know, and, you know, tax-free uh, municipal bonds in the state where the beneficiary is, or the use of annuities, or investing in capital growth assets that aren't generating dividends. Uh, so there's a number of ways we can also look at, as an advisor, how uh, we can deal with the income tax issue. Good point. 
Would a beneficiary be at risk to lose SSI if the tax was flowed through to the differently able beneficiary? Uh, I like how you said different, differently able beneficiary, and I've used the term disabled only for purposes of how the tax code and rules work, uh, because uh, it's always a person first, um, a person maybe with special needs or someone who's differently able. Um, no, the reporting on a tax return uh, does not um, impact whether someone qualifies for SSI or Medicaid. Um, and it's just a matter of explaining that. It's only if the individual, that beneficiary has actual income or assets in their own name um, and, and or a trust was improperly drafted, which would uh, make all the assets in the trust uh, available to the beneficiary. So uh, even though some people worry about that, uh, no problem. And I've been doing this uh, for decades and, uh, and don't see any issue there at all. Okay. Um, is there a limit that a beneficiary receives as income to disqualify for government benefits? Well, as I said, if it's for the benefit of, it's not gonna be counted against their income budget. But the general rule is that beneficiary, if they have income, fixed income coming in, then that will adversely impact SSI benefits and Medicaid and, and the rules, depending on which benefit we're in and uh, perhaps what state you live in, uh, will have an impact. So, but the income of the trust will not uh, disqualify that beneficiary. On a complex trust, that's a non-grantor trust, if the beneficiary reports income, could that affect government benefits? No, no, no. Not when we're talking about SSI and Medicaid. Does a first party trust have to distribute DNI? No, there's no requirement. It's a, both of these trusts are discretionary trusts and there would be no requirement. Now, uh, and even if we were taking uh, retirement funds in with the required minimum distributions, there's no requirement to then um, pay it out other than you have to follow um, the, um, uh, the, the rules of the uh, trust. Okay. Let's just see, we have another uh, minute here. Why would you fund any stint for a disabled child prior to the death of one of both parents? Well, uh, one, it's the uh, parents feeling uh, strongly like they, they want to get it done in advance. They want to they want to put assets aside and segregate them. It might be to save estate taxes, maybe not. Uh, they want to put in perhaps a trustee and uh, or a co-trustee that they know they're working with and and have some track record before they pass away. Uh, it may be that others may want to fund that trust as well. So it becomes a family trust in effect. So grandparents may want to add to it or an aunt or uncle. And so setting it up during lifetime makes it easier for them. All right. With that, um, I think we've um, run out of uh, time here. And so I want to thank everyone for taking the time today. Uh, hopefully this has all been helpful. Everybody have a great day. And um, I'm always happy to be a resource in my law firm to all of you around the country. Any way I can help, I'm here for you. Thank you all.